Okay, so this is Leah Noche, and I'm just going to cover the highlights that I think are important for you to know in pediatric hemonc. So starting with the anemias, um, three specific anemias that we're looking at. Uh, first is sickle cell anemia, iron deficiency anemia, and then aplastic anemia. Thanks to everyone who's already looked at the discussion board, watched the video on sickle cell and the new treatment that's um, hopefully soon available to everybody. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic uh, disorder that's passed down. Hemoglobin A is partially or completely replaced by abnormal hemoglobin that sickles. Um, and you saw that in the little video. Um, so this is a genetic disorder. There's a few tests and some of you listed uh, the more um, accurate testing, but at birth, everyone that's born in the United States gets screened for sickle cell, among many other uh, genetic disorders in that state newborn screening that we do on infants before they leave the hospital. Um, and then if, if that is kicked off as a positive, then we would do more advanced testing. So the problem with hemoglobin S is that it's very sensitive to changes in oxygen content uh, circulating in um, your body and on the red blood cell. And so any increase in demand um, that causes decreased oxygen supply causes those cells to sickle. And so you have all kinds of situations, uh, like if you have an illness, you get sick, and you get a fever, or you get dehydrated or stressed or exercise induced, that can cause those cells to sickle. What we worry about most is a sickle cell crisis, and that's an acute exacerbation of the disease. The severity range, there's a range from mild to moderate to severe, um, and is generally considered reversible with treatment, but that's not without causing potential damage to multiple organ systems um, before it is reversed. So here's a little uh, picture of a boy who is experiencing sickle cell crisis. You've got um, those sickle shaped cells, they clump up all of the blood vessels. And so you've got potential for these four types of crises, vasoocclusive, so clumping up the cells in your microcirculation. So you can have ischemia anywhere where your capillaries are. Um, ischemia and then infarction, so they can actually have strokes. Um, and more severe, that it can cause paralysis and death. It can cause retinopathy, uh, blindness, or little micro hemorrhages. It can cause uh, what's called avascular necrosis, so a cut off of the blood supply in your shoulder. Um, it can cause problems in the spleen and the liver. So splenic sequestration, clumping of cells in the spleen. Um, and you know that your spleen is important in terms of uh, storing red blood cells. So if the supply is cut off to your spleen, you can have profound anemia, hypovolemia, and go into shock. And then in the liver, the sickle crisis can cause hyperhemolytic crisis. Uh, and then a subsequent accelerated rate of red blood cell destruction, um, and then anemia and jaundice. So when your red blood cells are destroyed, they release a bunch of byproducts into the circulation. One of those things is um, bilirubin, which causes jaundice. And then they can also have aplastic crisis, causing a decreased production and increased destruction of the red blood cells. And that's usually triggered by viral illness. Um, and can also be caused by um, a decrease in folic acid stores. So pain, you know, pain often brings them into the hospital, but as you can see on the diagram of this child, they can have signs and symptoms all over their body, depending on which uh, organs are affected at the time. So your nursing priority actions, number one is going to be hydration. If you can kind of dilute out uh, the blood circulation um, and get 
get things moving again. Hydration is key. So um, if they show up in the hospital, if that's going to be IV fluid. And we, we give multiple saline boluses. Saline boluses in kids, we give it per kilo. So 10 mLs per kilo IV would be a starting dose, and you can go up to 40 mLs per kilo of normal saline um, if they're dehydrated or in shock. Um, you can also increase PO fluids uh, if they're not in a severe crisis, and you want to make sure you also support them with electrolytes. So you would definitely be getting baseline labs on a patient like this and, and see if they have any electrolyte disturbances. Second is oxygen, because what causes the crisis to begin with is this decrease or this increase in demand for oxygen. So you always want to put these kids on some sort of oxygen, whether that's with a cannula or a mask. And then after you're looking at their um, blood cell counts, if they are anemic, <clears throat> you can give a blood transfusion. Or if they're just in crisis, giving blood, giving blood with normal cells can help get things moving. And we also do something called an exchange transfusion where we actually reduce the volume of their blood cells. So we'll take out um, 15 to 20 mLs per kilo of their blood and replace it with fresh blood that does not have those sickle cells in it. As you saw in the video, pain control is very, very important for these patients. And I appreciate the discussion that's going on on the discussion board. I've actually absolutely had patients come to the ED at um, Seattle Children's where they feel that their pain was not managed uh, effectively or appropriately. These patients often require high, high dose narcotics more than we would give any other patients. So if you're not their primary care provider or they're not seen at your institution, it does make some providers uncomfortable giving such high doses when they don't know the patient. Of course, um, as a prescriber, you know, we always want to be cognizant of their respiratory status when you're giving high dose narcotics and you don't want to knock out that respiratory drive. And so you're always careful um, if they're not on some sort of respiratory support. That said, these, these patients can often handle more um, higher dose. So if you're if you have a patient like this in the ED um, you and they're in acute crisis, you would keep them overnight or for a few nights until things are improved. Um, other considerations, positioning for comfort. Um, you'll see in the book some tips for nutrition management. You're going to monitor for complications. So on the screen before, how the sickling can affect multiple organ systems, you're going to watch for for complications in all of those systems. So <coughs> you're going to watch for changes in um, neuro status, um, vision, strength, uh, all of those things you're going to be assessing. Um, you want to make sure that these kids stay up to date on their vaccines and get their annual flu shot. If you can prevent infections, then that can help um, prevent sickle crises that are caused by infection. So that's important. And then you want to prevent crisis. So when you're um, sending them home and doing discharge teaching, you want to offer to the family any uh, additional things that will help prevent crisis, like exercise, you know, overexerting themselves with exercise and things like that. And then for iron deficiency and aplastic anemias, I did a side by side because you do need to be able to differentiate. Um, so I wanted you to see the comparison. Iron deficiency anemia is pretty self explanatory and probably the most common anemia that we see in kids. Um, and that just means that your iron stores are depleted and you need the iron to make hemoglobin to make red blood cells. So um, babies are born with. They get a surge of iron uh, and hemoglobin from their mom right prior to delivery. <coughs> Those stores eventually wear off and then the baby's bone marrow needs to then start creating its own red blood cell production to replace the losses. 
Um, babies, uh, there's not a lot of iron in breast milk, um, but the iron in breast milk is better absorbed than supplemental iron. And then once kids start eating solid foods, which is around six months of age, um, we make sure that we offer them foods that are uh, fortified with iron. Um, so what's the cause of iron deficiency? Anemia, lack of, uh, lack of iron, or can also be caused by blood loss. So that would be an acute thing that's easily treatable. Um, anything that causes increased metabolic demand like sepsis. GI malabsorption, where they're not able to uh, absorb the dietary intake. Um, so in the hospital, we see kids with like short gut or any of the autoimmune GI disorders where they have absorption problems can lead to iron deficiency anemia. And then simply an inadequate diet, so lack of access to nutritious foods that have iron in them. We do re routine screening at the peds office uh, a couple times in infancy and um, early childhood. And then it's not really checked routinely after that. Um, but certainly if you have signs and symptoms, we would, it's an easy screen to just run a CBC and check for that. Um, so signs and symptoms, fatigue, paleness, uh, on your labs, it's going to show a low hemoglobin, a low hematocrit, and specific to iron deficiency anemia, the red blood cells are microcytic and hypochromic. So it's, it's not like that with any other type of anemia. Microcytic, the cells are just very, very small when you look at them on the slide, and hypochromic, they're very pale, and that's how we differentiate what type of anemia it is. With aplastic anemia, you have decreased circulating red blood cells due to a bone marrow problem, and that can be caused by many, many things. Uh, so some of the potential things causing that, myelotoxic agents, um, like some of the chemotherapies, a virus, uh, other various like bacterial infections, autoimmune diseases, and allergies. And actually, we also see this in the premature infant population, they, they have some bone marrow suppression because of their immature systems that they do typically then grow out of. Um, for a, a true ongoing aplastic anemia, it needs to be diagnosed by bone marrow aspiration. And what you're looking for is, at, is the um, concentration of red marrow to yellow marrow. And so the, if you recall, the red marrow in your, in your bones is what makes the red blood cell lines. Um, if you're looking at uh, CBC with aplastic anemia, you're going to see pancytopenia. So what does that mean? That means that all of your cell lines are uh, decreased because your bone marrow is responsible for creating all of those cell lines. So we're talking about your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and all the differentiated cells. You'll, they'll just all be lower in numbers. On clinic exam, you might see petechiae, bleeding, purpura. Um, the patient is going to be weak and feel fatigue and maybe have tachycardia if they're very anemic. Nursing priorities for these anemias. So for iron deficiency, blood transfusion as needed, and that would typically only be done if they were very, very anemic or if they had other health problems where you thought they couldn't really mount a response to recover from this. And obviously iron replacement, and that can be done orally or um, IV if they're in the hospital and also IM. So we can give high dose iron that way. And then you're also gonna do some dietary counseling and ensure that they're eating things that are rich in iron. For aplastic anemia, they are doing bone marrow transplants for that to replace some of those cell lines and, and give the bone marrow a boost. If it's caused by an autoimmune disorder, then they may put the patient on immunosuppressive medications to stop that. And then we also have um, a couple of medications that stimulate the bone marrow to start making those cell lines. So GCSF, also known as colony stimulating factor, is one of them. 
and also Neupogen is another one. And so you'll also see those in the adult cancer um, units. The same same idea. It stimulates the bone marrow to start <clears throat> making blood cells faster. And of course, um, they are also uh, also they can get blood transfusions as needed. So also in pediatric heme, uh, bleeding or clotting disorders, um, we use those terms interchangeably. Um, so hemophilia is one of your primary bleeding disorders that we see. Von Willebrand is similar to hemophilia. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that at length, but I just wanted you to be aware that it is present. Um, and then DIC, which stands for Disseminated Intravascular Coagulopathy. I'm not going to talk about that either, um, but I just want you to know that it's there as a bleeding disorder. DIC happens when a patient is in, goes into shock for whatever reason. It could be an infection or near drowning or something like that where they're in shock. And um, the liver it is not... Um, does not get oxygen for a time and stops um, supporting the, the blood flow and the spleen and the bone marrow, everything kind of shuts down. And so you get into a situation where the patient is bleeding. Um, so just know that those are there and that they happen in children as well. But I'm gonna talk about hemophilia. So hemophilia A and B, um, A is the most common. This is an X-linked recessive disorder. So it's passed down from mother to their sons or to daughters as carriers, but the, the sons are the ones that exhibit the disease. <coughs> so this is a genetic disorder and it results from a deficiency of one of the coag coagulation factors um, or proteins that help in the clotting cascade. And I, you, you can see on this diagram here, um, if you look closely, there's an injury and then damaged tissue. And then your body is supposed to make all of these proteins, um, factor two, factor two A, factor five, factor six, factor 10, factor eight. Um, all of those are the precursors to thrombin. Um, that make your clot. So prothrombin and then thrombin and then fibrinogen and fibrin and then you form a clot and you stop the, the bleeding. In hemophilia and von Willebrand disorder, uh, those patients are missing one of the clotting factors in this cascade. And so if we can identify specifically which factor they're deficient in, we can replace just that factor and stop the bleeding. Ideally, you would know um, if there's a family history of hemophilia specifically or bleeding disorders. Um, certainly when women come in in labor and they're carriers, we watch for bleeding in the patients and you can send off screening tests. If you don't, uh, if you don't have that information and you just have a patient that's bleeding, you can transfuse them with plasma, which contains all of the factors. But say that you've identified that this patient has hemophilia A or they're at risk for hemophilia A because of the family history, then you can just start replacing with factor eight and the blood bank will um, pull off those factors and have that available. So these patients present with abnormal bleeding, joint pain and bruising. And um, we actually see it, it presents in infancy, certainly if, a patient has had a procedure and um, they're, they don't clot or they're, they just seem to be bleeding uh, more than normal, that would be a patient I might screen initially with just a CBC so you can look at their platelet count. And then if they're continuing to show signs of bleeding, then you would send off um, what's called a DIC panel and that'll give your all your coagulopathy factors. So examples in the newborn period when, you know, the first time a child is in the hospital, it might just be blood glucose checks on a baby or 
when they get their state newborn screen and it just doesn't seem to um, clot easily. That might be an indication to do a CBC. Also, we see kids after a circumcision where they have profound blood loss in their diaper suddenly, um, and that is often how a bleeding disorder is caught, something like that. So those are just some examples. You might also see a baby, you might examine a baby after delivery that has a lot of petechiae, and that would um, be an indication of suspicion that you want to investigate a little further. So your nursing priority actions for bleeding, you want to monitor for bleeding. Children are most at risk for bleeding in their brain because they have very fragile developing blood vessels. And so you're going to be assessing neurostatus. And if they present with bleeding, certainly we would do more studies and look at their head if we're um, worried about it. But if, if we have a proven hemophilia, then that would certainly initiate some scans of the head. Another place that children bleed pretty easily is in the kidneys. So um, you would do a renal ultrasound to look for bleeding there and you're gonna assess for hematuria. So your priority actions, you're gonna treat the bleeding. If they're bleeding in the, their joints, um, their knees or, or ankle joints, you're gonna immobilize, elevate and apply pressure. Certainly if you have active bleeding anywhere, you're gonna apply pressure. And then the, the main treatment is to replace whichever factor they are deficient in. So you're going to give that um, product or plasma. And then assess and treat pain. Again, if they're bleeding somewhere, they can have pain kind of anywhere in their body, wherever the bleeding is. Discharge teaching. You're going to teach parents the basic first aid and how to control bleeding. Um, what to look out for, and then avoidance of contact sports and wearing protective gear. And if you can imagine going home with a toddler with hemophilia, it's, you know, quite a bit of work. They're always bumping their heads. They're always falling down. So these parents have to be extra careful. Okay, on to pediatric oncologic disorders. I'm just going to talk about the most um, common ones that we see. So um, organ neoplasms and blood neoplasms. And then I did not go into depth about bone and soft tissue cancers, but we do see some of those as well. And the information is also in your textbook. So the most common organ neoplasms that we see, number one is Wilms tumor, also known as nephroblastoma. And this is a tumor that is either just in your abdominal cavity or off of your kidneys. Uh, the peak incidence is by age three, so somewhere between age two and three. This type of tumor is rarely metastatic, so usually it um, stays where it started and is self-limiting um, and is typically caught right away before it can spread. So usually these kids have an abdominal mass that's growing um, and they are kind of lethargic and have fevers, pallor. They can have urinary retention because it's on the kidney and weight loss. <clears throat> Treatments for this are surgery to remove it and um, radiation and chemotherapy. And then neuroblastoma, and these are side by side again because they're both um, in the abdominal cavity and they're similar, but neuroblastoma is usually occurring a little bit older. Uh, this is on your adrenals, so you have, again, abdo some uh, abdominal swelling or a mass, a palpable mass. And this arises from neural crest cells during fetal development. So these are cells that were supposed to differentiate into your kidneys and adrenals, but ran amok and turned into this neuroblastoma instead. Um, neuroblastoma is often invasive and um, it's more aggressive, can grow in the abdomen, it can grow into the spinal, uh, spinal canal area and is, is pretty nasty. So these kids will have a mass in their abdomen, 
They can have urinary frequency or retention, just depending on how much pressure it's applying to the kidneys. Um, and pallor, weakness, and weight loss again. So treatment for this is, again, surgery, radiation, and chemo. And if this tumor is you know, growing through other organs, like through your intestine or through your spinal cord, it, it's obviously a much more difficult surgery to do. Um, and you, you know, the symptoms can vary as well, depending on what else is involved. Also, anytime you have any tumor, certainly parents would present and say, you know, his abdomen has been swollen and we have all of these other symptoms. But if you identify a mass on exam, if you ever think there's a risk of cancer, you don't want to keep palpating it because you can spread those cancer cells throughout, um, throughout the body. So, uh, Blood cancers, leukemia is the most common cancer that we see in childhood. Um, it's caused by a malignant increase in leukocytes coming from the bone marrow. And usually the bone marrow kicks off a whole bunch of immature cells that are not very effective as uh, leukocytes. Of all the le leukemias, ALL is the most common type, um, acute lymphocytic leukemia. And uh, leukemia in children peaks between age two to five. We're not sure what causes it, but the risk factors are uh, certainly genetic um, and then viral, immune, or environmental factors. Diagnosis of leukemia ultimately will be diagnosed by a CBC, but you have a child presenting with fever, pallor, fatigue. They may or may not have petechiae, bone or joint pain. They could have um, be presenting with frequent infections um, and then just depending on how far it has gone, you can have that white blood cell increase infiltration into your lungs, kidneys, and GI tract. And so they may have symptoms that are specific to those organ systems. Treatment for leukemia is going to, um, just depending on the type, chemotherapy, radiation, stem cell transplant, and blood transfusion. <coughs> So nursing considerations for all uh, oncologic disorders. Number one, you need to know the phases of chemotherapy. And this applies to children and adults when you get into the adult world. So there are four phases. The first one is induction. Um, and the goal of induction is to achieve remission or have a, so a decrease in the number of those leukemic cells that are circulating or a complete disappearance of those cells. In the intensification stage, you're uh, looking to decrease the tumor burden. CNS prophylaxis, you want to prevent those leukemic cells from invading into the CNS. And then the maintenance phase, the goal is to maintain remission. And so all of these phases have different goals, different things you're trying to achieve. Um, and different nursing considerations that go with each one. You may be increasing the amount of chemotherapy or the type or decreasing, putting them on maintenance chemotherapy. So it just depends. And so I'd like you to read more about the phases of chemotherapy in your book. Other nursing considerations, you always want to protect these patients from in infections. As you know, we are suppressing their immune system, and so they're at very high risk and can get very, very sick if they get an infection. You want to monitor for intracranial pressure, um, and that has to do with um, chemotherapy and the symptoms of that. And there's a great um, table in the textbook that shows you the signs and symptoms of ICP in children. Um, so in infants, that would be like a bulging fontanelle, irritability, high-pitched cry, difficulty feeding, 
In children, they may have headaches, nausea, vomiting, um, blurred vision. Kids can be irritable or restless, um, or they can have an increase in sleep and lethargy. And then, of course, late signs with increased in ICP, you're going to have bradycardia, delayed motor response, delayed sensory response. So we do a lot of neuro assessments kind of with each, um, each nursing hands on. It's important just depending on the state of the child to always do those neuro checks. You want to protect your patient from bleeding. Um, and then you want to know the adverse effects of radiation and chemotherapy. And there's a bunch of them. And um, of course, it depends on what type of chemo you're getting. But in general, um, changes to your GI tract, because in, in your intestines and GI tract, those are cells that turn over quickly. They, they, they grow, they die. And when you're taking chemo, it kills all of those cells. So you can have nausea, vomiting, you can have ulcers in your GI tract, um, diarrhea, things like that. Um, skin changes, hair loss, dry skin. So any nursing considerations that apply to good skin care would be important here. Um, your bladder is another place where there's a fast rate of skin, uh, of, sorry, not skin, of cell turnover. Um, so patients can get cystitis and you'll want to increase fluid intake and make sure that they're using the bathroom fr frequently and not holding on to urine um, and monitor for signs of hematuria. And then bone marrow suppression, just like protecting from infection. Um, you want to monitor for fevers. You want to give antibiotics if they're prescribed. Um, and then mo just monitoring for signs and keeping keeping uh, people who are sick away from these patients.